continue our study of Matthew chapter 4. We're going to move from the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness and his encounter with Satan um, to the beginning of his ministry. Now, Jesus has been fulfilling or redoing what prophets had spoke historically regarding Israel and the coming Messiah. Now tonight, Jesus is going to move into the realm of what he was called to do, why he is here, and, and moving towards that time when he is going to be executed on the cross. So we're going to start in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great life. Light And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Let's pray. Father, as we go into your word tonight, I ask Holy Spirit that you would open our eyes and our hearts to uh, what is being said here, God. And um, Lord, that we would see uh, the relevance of Jesus' ministry and his call on his disciples. So Lord, bless us with your presence. And we thank you, God, in Jesus' name, and all the church said. Amen. So John the Baptist's time of preparation for the Lord Jesus has ended. He is now in custody uh, of King Herod, and we're going to look at that in a couple of chapters. And so it says that when Jesus hears of John's arrest, that he goes into the region of Galilee, and specifically he goes to Zebulon and Naphtali. Why does he go there? Well, we have to go to the prophet Isaiah to understand. Why? Because Matthew quotes Isaiah to give us an idea of why Jesus is going to go to this region. So if you open to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, I'm in the New King James Version. It says, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. As when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined." So in verse 1 there, it says, nevertheless, the gloom. Well, what gloom is being spoken of here? Well, this is a carryover from chapter 8. Remember that there was no chapters, there was no verses when these writings were, were put on parchment. It was actually just one long scroll of writing. So chapter 8 spills into chapter 9. And in chapter 8, is Isaiah is warning Judah about the coming invasion from the Assyrians. The Assyrians are going to come, and they're going to wreak havoc on Judah, and they're going to take them captive. Why? Because Judah had been in sin for many, many years, had been playing with idolatry. They had not been honoring the land. Every seventh year, you were supposed to rest the land. And God said, enough is enough. I'm going to take you away for seven years. I'm going to get my 70 years of rest that should have happened with the land. I'm going to get it as you're put into captivity. Now, Isaiah 8.28, it's the last verse of chapter 8, says this, Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. Now, the invasion of the, of the Assyrians would be terrible for the Jewish people, and especially for those in the northern regions of the Promised Land, and that's the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. All right? Then it says in verse 1, I'm going to read the rest of it, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. What is he talking about here? In this context, the promise of Isaiah chapter 9-1 is a very precious promise. 
the northern regions of the promised land, around the Sea of Galilee, which is called, the Gal- is called Galilee of the Gentiles, they were the most severely ravaged when the Assyrians invaded from the north. That was the first time, that was the first position that the Assyrians hit. And when they hit, they hit with the full force of their army. It devastated the land. It was horrible what happened. So this promise is that this land, which once seemingly was lightly esteemed by the Lord, will one day have such a blessing. Lightly esteemed meaning in a sense that God had almost forgotten about them, right? Verse 2 says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon them a light has shined. So now here's the thing. The northern tribes were the first to suffer from the Syrian invasions, as I said, but in God's mercy, they were the first to be restored. When they came back from captivity, when the first of the captives were allowed, were set free from Assyria, it was those from this northern region. And therefore, they were the first to see the light of God's mercy. In the same way that God showed his light and his mercy upon this region, it would also be the first place that the light of the Messiah was going to be seen by the people. So in reality, Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 through 16, it quotes this passage and it clearly shows the fulfillment of the Galilean ministry of Jesus. Remember, the majority of Jesus' ministry took place in this northern area of Israel, around the Sea of Galilee. So God certainly, most certainly, did have a special blessing for this place that was once lightly esteemed land. Church, some of you tonight, you might feel lightly esteemed. You might feel like, God, where are you at, God? You know, where are you at? How come you're not? I don't feel like you're loving me or caring for me. Listen, God cares for you. I don't understand what's going on, what affliction you may be dealing with, but it will be for a brief moment. Seventy years is a long time, but yet in the span of things, it was a very short time for the nation of Judah to be in captivity. Just remember, whatever you're going through, God loves you, and he remembers you. And like this region that saw the light of the Messiah, he wants to show his light and his love to you. Verse 17 of Matthew 4 says, From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the first thing I want to want to point out here is that Jesus began to preach. Now, one might say that this was the main occupation of Jesus. He did heal and he did minister to many miraculously. But on the whole, it would seem fair to say that Jesus was a preacher and a teacher who healed more than he was a healer who preached and taught. Jesus brought the gospel message. Now, he also says, repent, repent. The gospel Jesus preached is the same one that John the Baptist preached. John the Baptist said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. for The kingdom of God is near, right? In fact, since Jesus waited until John had been put in prison, right, It would make sense that really what Jesus was doing is he was picking up where John left off. But here's the thing. Jesus would go further than John ever did. John announced the coming Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Now you're hearing it firsthand from the very person that John was speaking of. Now, the question came up. What does this term mean? And we, t- we touched on it a couple of weeks back. Well, after really studying on this, here's what I'm going to tell you. Neither John nor Jesus attempted to explain the meaning of this term. It's not explained. John doesn't explain it. Jesus doesn't explain it. Here's what you need to understand. It's probably reasonable to assume 
that the people to whom this message was given had some conception of its meaning, right? The Jews of the first century in Palestine had a clear understanding, otherwise Matthew would have explained what it meant. He would have said, here's why this is being said by John. Here's why this is being said by Jesus. There's no explanation. Theologians over the past 20 centuries have attempted to fit this term into some system of theology and come up with all these different meanings of what it is. Here's the bottom line. This is, I, I believe, what Shazir said, Dr. Shazir. First century Jews seem to understand this term to be the sum total of all the prophecies of the Old Testament concerning the coming kingdom from heaven to set up a kingdom on this earth with heaven's standard. And that's what it's about. The standard that God is going to bring is yet to come. It's at hand. It's near. But it's not here. And it won't be here until Jesus returns and establishes his throne on earth. Now, another thing I want to bring out is some people make elaborate distinctions between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. But there actually seems to be no difference at all, especially in light of the Jewish custom of often not even naming God directly. Like I can tell you in my classes that people will write G slash D. They won't even put an O in there because they won't say God. So really, because they won't name God directly, they will name where he's at. And where is God at? He is in heaven. And so it appears here that as in Matthew's writing that he's, he's writing to these to Jews who understand what is being said, the phraseology that is being used. And I always tell you, church, we have to always remember who the audience is that this is being written to. This is not being written to 21st century Christians. It is not being written to us. It was written to a Jewish audience who understood what John or what Matthew was saying here. That doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to us. But we cannot take first century writings and try to cram them into 21st century theology. It doesn't work. And that's why there's so many mistakes in Bible prophecy and all these other types of things. Because we try to put it into our terms. That's impossible to do. There are things that are happening around this that can fall into prophetic terms. But we have to be very careful with that. Very, very careful. Because let me tell you something. The devil is very good at taking the word of God and misleading people. He's very, very good at it. We have to be careful with the church. Verse 18 says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, And he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. So we see here that Jesus sees two brothers, Peter and Andrew, and they're casting a net into the sea. Now, here's what I want you to peep out here, church. This is not the first encounter Jesus has with these two brothers. It's not the first one. The gospel writers, John and Luke, They described previous encounters before the two were called. If you go to first John, or excuse me, to John chapter 1, verse 35, it says this. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed him. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. 
So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So they already had a previous encounter there. Luke chapter 5, 3 tells us this. Getting into one of the boats, this is Jesus, which was Simon's. He asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And then later on in verse 11, after Jesus is done teaching, it says, And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Church, we have to understand how chronologically things work in the Bible. First off, the Gospels were never meant to line up perfectly. Chronologically, there's some things that are different in the Gospels. It doesn't change the narrative, but there's a reason things are positioned where they were at. They had not been called in those two different passages of Scripture. But now, in Matthew chapter 4, they have another encounter with Jesus. He sees them. In the other encounters, they saw him. He sees them, and he says, come and follow me. There's a difference. There's a difference. When Jesus sees us, when the Holy Spirit is calling us, that's a lot. Of, that's different. Listen, many times Jesus encounters people before they hear the call to a relationship. I can't tell you how many times I had an encounter with Jesus. It wasn't until that moment when I really knew who Jesus was. I really realized how much Jesus loved me. I really knew that Jesus was speaking to me. Not me wanting him because I needed something in my life or I wanted something changed in my life, but me wanting him because he loved me for who I was. Church, don't grow weary with your loved ones and people you're praying for who you you want to see come into a relationship with Jesus, don't grow weary. In due time, Jesus is going to see them and call them, and they're going to respond. They're going to respond. He's calling now, but they need to respond. Now, you need to know something. The fishing business was a very lucrative profession. Mark chapter 1, verse 20 tells us that James and John left their father with the hired servants. They had, enough, they had a big enough business that they had people that they hired that worked for them, right? What you need to understand, it wasn't as if they were poor and had nothing to give up or lose by going and following Jesus. They gave up a lot. Like every one of you at this table, walk away from your job tomorrow and go follow Jesus. Go, go into the ministry and do something. That's what Jesus is asking them to do. Charles Spurgeon says something interesting. He says, God usually calls people as they are busy doing something. Jesus called the apostles as they were casting a net into the sea or mending their nets. They were busy in a lawful occupation when he called them to be ministers. Our Lord does not call idlers, but fishers. Think about all the people who have been called in the Bible who were busy doing something when God called them. Saul was looking for his father's donkeys. And Samuel says, "Ah," God says, there's the one. David was keeping his father's sheep. The shepherds were guarding their flocks. Amos was farming in Tekoa. Matthew was working a tax table. Moses was tending his father-in-law's flocks. Gideon was threshing wheat. Let me tell you something right now. God does not use those who are idle and do nothing. Why? Because they will never complete the task. Follow through is the biggest thing for me. Biggest thing. And when people don't follow through, I know it's because you're idle. You're not being about your father's business. You're idle. You're busy doing everything else, but you're not busy. But you're, you're too busy for God, but you're not busy for everything else. God says, no. You want to be that way? Go ahead and continue. I will not use you. Now, he tells them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Church, 
peep this out. The Lord prepares us for the work He has through the work we have done. Right? The biggest, best training ground I ever had was my secular job and, and when I was a supervisor for that job. Because I encountered so much attack, so much friction, a lot of pressure, having to make quick decisions, having to make life and death decisions, all these types of things that I was forced with. It taught me how to interact, how to keep things where I need to keep them at in the heat of the battle, how to deal with adversarial people. You, a lot of you guys don't understand when, I, when people talk crazy to me, how I just don't go off. It's just like I learned a gentle wrath turns or gentle response turns away wrath i don't need to get loud and crazy with you and so he he takes us he prepares us for the work that we've been doing for the work that he's going to have us do these men knew how to catch fish let me tell you something it was a tough business at times how many times did they be out fishing all night in the bible and didn't catch nothing Jesus, hey, throw the net on the other side, dude. You'll get something. Yeah, whatever. It was a tough business. And they needed to have patience and perseverance. At church, these are qualities that we all need to have when it comes to dealing with lost people. We have to have patience. We have to have perseverance. Now, people ask, well, why did Jesus have followers? Why? Well, it wasn't uncommon for a rabbi to have followers in Jesus' day. And so what Jesus is doing is normal for those who want to be educated. And so Jesus offered them a traditional education at the feet of a rabbi. In other respects, this was very different from a normal rabbinical education because it was Jesus. And so they are sitting at the, at the rabbi of rabbi's feet. Rabboni, they called him. The last thing I want to touch on in all this is when Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. What happened when he said, follow me? Did they hesitate? Did they think about it? Did they... Do the Christian thing. I've got to go pray about that and make sure this is God. No, it says they left their boat immediately and followed him. Immediately. Church, their immediate response is a good example to us. We need to respond immediately when God speaks to us. I, I don't know about you, there's not a whole lot of direction that I have to pray about because I believe God is guiding me. And so I know that if I'm off track, God's going to bring me back. I know if I start walking in a direction I shouldn't, God's going to close the door. He's going to call me back. I really honestly think that sometimes we just use the prayer thing as an excuse because in our minds, we already made up our mind, we're going to say no. Well, it's already no, but if I say I prayed about it and then I come back, and say, well, I prayed about it, and the answer is no, well, then how can I get mad, right? How can I go, well, you know, golly. Let me tell you something. If I told you there's a million dollars in the parking lot, and the first one to get to it gets it, you would be out that door in a moment. No hesitation, right? You would be out the door. I'd, I'd, man, I'd hobble. I'd get, I'd get there somehow. I mean, church... The prize is Jesus. That's the prize. It's not the ministry. See, that's what killed me before God took me in the wilderness for five years. It was the ministry. It was the ministry. It was the ministry. And Jesus was the prize, but I couldn't see that. And then when I realized that Jesus was the prize, I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. And, and I had more to fill my plate than I ever had. But when your mind is Jesus and not the ministry or yourself or what it can bring you, right? But when your mind is Jesus, you'll be amazed at the things you can accomplish. You'll, you'll be amazed at the hours 
in the day that you can squeeze stuff into, you'll be like, wow, I never thought I could get that done. But you can. Why? Because you're, the prize is Christ. And God supernaturally takes time. And I mean, literally, he stands time still for me sometimes. This afternoon, I'm telling you, time just stood still. I kept looking at my watch and it'd be like five minutes later and it felt like two hours later. But I was getting so much done. When Jesus speaks to us, church, we need to respond and we need to respond immediately. No excuses. Go and do. What does Yoda say? Do or do not. There is no try. Right? I mean, that's the, that's the reality of it. Do or do not. There is no try. Oh, I'm going to try to make it at church tonight. Do make it to church tonight. I'm going to try to make it to men's breakfast on Saturday. No, do make it to men's breakfast on Saturday. There's a difference in attitude. When I say I'm going to try, I've already talked myself halfway out of it. I'm already halfway out the door. I'm not showing up. And then if I don't show up, I've already told you, well, I told you I would try to get there. When people tell me try, I, I don't even count on you. I'm just like, well, I know you're not coming. Don't do that with Jesus. I'm flesh and blood, but don't do that to your master. Don't do that to Jesus, man, because I'm going to tell you something as I close. Following Jesus means leaving something behind. It means leaving something behind, and some of us don't want to leave anything behind. And the problem is, is that you need to leave it. The Samaritan woman, she left her pitcher that she went to go fill the water with. Matthew left his tax table that was a lucrative business for him. And blind Bartimaeus left his cloak to follow Jesus. What do you need to leave tonight to follow Jesus? What is it that you need to leave? Because there's always a cost to follow the Lord. I'm sorry that that's just the reality of it. And we don't want to give up our comfort. We don't want to give up anything. But Jesus says it doesn't work that way. He says, deny yourself. Deny yourself. Then you take up your cross. See, unless we deny ourselves, church, we're not worthy to follow him. Because we'll never follow him with our whole heart. We'll always follow him half-hearted. And then when he doesn't follow through like we want, we get upset with him. And he says, can I have all of you? I just want every piece of you, every fiber of you, every atom of you. I created you. I created you wonderfully. I made you specifically for a purpose that I have. And unfortunately, church, a lot of us miss out on that purpose because we're unwilling to sacrifice we're unwilling to move away things away from things that we need to. Church, follow the example of these four men tonight. Jesus said, come, and they immediately, immediately left a lucrative business to walk with the master. And it don't get any better than that, church. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for this reminder that when you call us, God, we need to drop everything and go. And Lord, I thank you for this reminder, God, in my own life, Lord, how I hesitate, how I can stumble around and uh, um, think of ways that I, I can get out of something, Lord. And I, I thank you for just uh, piercing my heart, Lord, and just reminding me, God, that that's not, that's not your way and that's not what you have for us. I pray you bless my brothers and sisters tonight, God. Father, that you just pour your love and your spirit into them, Lord. Father, we, um, we desperately need you. And um, Father, um, we're so thankful that we have you and your grace in our lives, Lord. Thank you for the grace, Lord, because I'm a, whew, I need it. I'm a, I'm a bumbling idiot at times. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would go before us now and give us rest tonight, Lord, and May we awaken tomorrow refreshed and knowing that the day you've given us is the day that you've made. We ask this humbly in Jesus' name.